Our Father, we are so grateful that you have blessed us to be here. As we delve into this conversation, we ask that we will be able to express ourselves and that at the end we will have success and fruitful conversation. In your name we pray. Amen. Okay, good evening again and welcome to this public engagement forum. For those who are here with us, we are always happy to engage with you in person. To those of you who could not make it and you are tuned in, welcome. Also like to welcome here the clerk of council who is normally dutifully taking notes and making sure that she documents anything that is important. So welcome Mrs. Baker. This evening we are here to discuss, share, and to pool our thoughts together on the topic, the status of the UK's overseas territories in the 21st century. We know that the constitutional arrangement of the UK's overseas territories and whether the relationship is satisfactory and appropriate in the 21st century. This is the main focus of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee's new inquiry. And this is a committee of the House of Parliament in the UK. And so what we're gathering here is evidence for this committee of inquiry. While 10 of the overseas territories are self-governing, the UK is responsible for their defense, foreign relations, the interaction between the overseas territories and the UK Parliament, and the government was brought to the attention of the UK Parliament during the passage of the Sanctions and Money Laundering Act of 2018, where the unusual step was taken to extend the, the act to cover the UK's jurisdictions. The committee is seeking evidence on how the UK Parliament and the civil service engages with us as overseas territories and across different government departments. They're also looking to find out how our interests are represented in the UK Parliament and how our rights as British overseas citizens are protected. As a result, all of the UK overseas territories have been invited to submit responses to this committee by September 5th, 2023. The terms of reference of this committee are displayed here on the screen, and we're going to do our best to see if this can generate some conversation this evening. The lines between local government and the UK's responsibilities can sometimes bleed into each other. However, in order to ensure that we are able to put forward a solid response, let us be clear in identifying the issues as we see them as it relates to our relationship with the UK so that we can document with some confidence the voice of the people as captured is captured correctly. The office of the speaker went about trying to gather some information in preparation for this evening and felt that we should break down the conversation according to a few papers that you can find on the UK Parliament's website, namely the UK's relationship with its overseas territories, a paper which was published on the 18th of May 2023, and a policy paper, 2023, the UK and Overseas Territories Joint Ministerial Council communique, along with a document calling the UK Overseas Territories and their governors, and of course, our own constitution. And so we'll be looking at these broad areas of partnership and principles, financial support and aid, constitutional affairs, security, defense and border, immigration and governance. Please use the microphone that, I, that is there in the middle. 
um, to voice your concerns and any suggestions or changes you would like to see. Please be mindful of others who may want to speak. You may come to the mic as often as you like. Please be respectful of other people's opinions and let us have a wonderful conversation that focuses on documenting exactly what we need for Montserrat. Here with me this evening are two former speakers of the Montserrat Legislative Assembly, Ms. Teresina Budkin and Ms. Shirley Osborne. They are here to help facilitate the conversation and to add some historical perspective where necessary. I will ask them to give some brief remarks before we open to the floor. Thank you, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you for... Thank you for... for this and for inviting me to this. I remember we did this um, a few years ago, five years ago, Mrs. Baker, or so. Um, and I am... I recognize the importance of this. And one of the things I, I am really, really concerned about is that we, in the overseas territories, we, this is how we operate. We respond when Great Britain says we would like to do something. I remember having said at the last series, last set of these discussions, that I really, really believe that what ought to happen is that we, as groups of people, should be much more proactive in deciding, determining, declaring what we want, how we want to be, what resources we need, what support we need, what we don't want, um, instead of being always responding to these, these requests to say. And so um, if I say anything at all tonight, if my personal opinion is anything at all is going to be um, expressed, it is that first and foremost, the relationship ought to from our perspective, be much more proactive, much more us focusing on who we want to be, what we want to be, where we want to go, and expressing that to them. So that is what drives the conversation. Because what has always been happening is that we are told that we must do this, we must have that, we must agree to this, um, this particular international agreement or, else, or something else. And, um, and then we say yes, no, and very often by the time we hear it, it's a fait accompli which um, often, does not necessar often does not fit into who we think we are. So as far as the relationship is concerned, I think that's one of the, the things that we ought to be looking at. And how to facilitate, how to make that happen depends on us. So constitutional arrangements are things that are long term, just to change two words in a constitution can take forever. So we recognize that there are these things that will require time, but there are other things that do not and that we could do, in my, to my mind, a lot more to, to have happen. And that requires a much more open, much more um, continuous connection and conversation with the UK. In the last few weeks, there has been, there was a debate in the parliament about the overseas territories. Some of the remarks I found interesting some made me think, really? Because, but again, those are coming from people who are looking at us and deciding how they want us to be, how they want to be with us. And that is what has been driving the conversation. To my mind, what must happen is that it be the other way around. So I welcome these, these initiatives from the British government, but I think when we speak to them, those are one of the things we, we ought to ask for is we well, ask for is probably not the right word. One of the ones, one of the things we want to make we ought to make clear is that it is a relationship that in the 21st century has to be modern. Um, after my, Madam Speaker called me, I went looking, you know, kind of just looking back at some papers, and I saw, for example, the the last white paper talked about 400 years of shared history, and just went on to something else. For, it's not 400 years of shared history. It's a very specific history, and their, history, their part in that history is very different from ours. And when you say 400 years of shared history, we are, we are, 
we're all British now because we've shared 400 years of history. It sounds like we've all just come here working together and we're all good. And that's not true. That's not true. And those things need to be taken into consideration. And what I, what I am finding is a lot of, of the conversation nowadays is sort of, uh, you know, let's put these sort of things behind us. Let's put these things behind us. We can't afford to let that happen, to my mind. And in order to, to, to have these relationships work for us, we ought to be much more vocal and much more um, clear. The other thing, the only other thing um, I'd like to say before we start is, in order to be able to do that, we must be clear on who we want to be and where we want to go, what relationship we want, what, what country we want, what, how we want to be as a group of people. So therefore, we don't just respond to, here's the Constitution, here's the change that must be made in the Constitution. We get to say, here's what we would like in our Constitution, and they get to say, well, whatever it is, get said. Which brings it back to this, the, the original point. We get to decide. Whether it's constitutional, it's a question of governance, um, whether it's social issues, whether it's the fun, quote unquote, things like the Commonwealth Games, um, it doesn't really matter to my mind until, we, until and unless we are clear what we want Montserrat to be. Last night somebody said to me, we need to be able to describe ourselves in like one sentence. This is Montserrat, this is who we are. And then we work forward from there. Until we can do that, we are going to always be responding like this. And we know what happens when you are the one who's responding. It means that you are in the, in the not dominant position. You are in the reactive position. You are the second, right? And when that happens, you are at a disadvantage. And for my, to me, what I would like is a relationship that puts Montserrat at a better, at a higher advantage. And I said last, one last thing. The language that has been used about the overseas territories, that is being used overseas territories recently, has been bothersome to me. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of talk about governance, governance, governance. And it's expressed in ways that imply that we don't understand what governance is, that we don't, we're not doing it right. We are not doing it any worse than anybody else. And so when we talk about governance, one of the things we get to make clear is that governance for a country of 70, 80 million people cannot be exactly the same as governance of a country of 4,000. It cannot be. Adjustments and adaptations have to be made. And so we ought to, we need to be able to make those adaptations, insist on those adaptations, and not be penalized for them which we have been up until now. So I think that our response to these has to be very clear, very strong, very bold, if we are to make any difference. So when responding to this question, what would you like the relationship to be? We would like the relationship to be a strong, open, bold, one of equals, because that's what we are. Small, but not ne smaller, but not unequal. Thank you. Okay, thank you, colleagues. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm not going to add too much to what has already been said, but I'd like to, there's, there's certain things that jumped out to me coming out of this process. One is that this has to be, as my colleague just said, an ongoing conversation. It has to be ongoing simply because the Constitution, I believe, should never be a static document. It must be dynamic. It must be responsive. It must understand where we are going, where we should be, where we want to be. Um, because where we are in 2023 is not where we were in 1962. And some of the conventions on which we now premise whatever we do were made for when the economic and social dynamics were very different, very much different. Um, I would also wish for us, as we shape this conversation, to take into account a number of things, a number of things that are going on around us. I'm sure all of us paid very close attention 
to the developments within the BVI, right, in very recent times. And I'm sure there is not one person in this room who was comfortable with the response of the colonial hierarchy in this instance. Um, but I don't know that I felt or heard us respond in, with any vigor. Because what we need to understand that today for the BVI, yesterday for Turks and Caicos, tomorrow it may be for Mantra. We don't know. And I feel we are a proud people, a strong people, brilliant people who have shaped our development. something of which I was extremely proud. I remember when I went to um, university back, that was back in 1972, okay? And I was in Barbados. And I felt extremely proud as I walked the roads in Barbados because we had better roads than they did. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel just great, just so proud. Um, I also remember that my contemporaries at college were eager to know if I knew Arrow. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right? So it made me feel even taller. Okay? Um, I know we had a very um, enviable, we had very enviable economic development coming down beginning in the 60s and working its way all the way down into the 90s when the Sufre Hills decided, well, it was time for me to, it was time to uh, make my presence felt. And somehow we seem to have lost our oomph, we seem to have lost our understanding of who we are and where we want to go. I don't believe we have really, but sometimes I don't think we find the expression for it um, too much. Okay. That said, because I don't want to be too long, but there's some other points I want to make. Um, Shirley spoke a minute or two ago about statements about governance. And I am in tandem with her on that one. Because here are people talking to us about governance as if we are the only ones who have an issue, right? We are the only ones. Do you know, do any of you in here know that Monstrat was the envy of this region, this Caribbean region, when it came to um, financial systems? Do you know that? We were, probably still are, okay? Um, so where this governance thing comes from, and we, we can't be pointing fingers over here when we have the same issues that you're pointing out. You're not dealing with them at home, but you want to um, crack the whip over us. And as I speak about cracking the whip, we have to be careful too, because sometimes some of us in our expressions seem to be reaching backwards and seem to be um, pleading with our colonial people to crack the whip over the people who we have placed at the apex of our governance. We ought to have more confidence in ourselves than that. Um, and I'll say, I'll leave that there. Um, I am also concerned with regard to our relationships with our regional partners. Beginning in the early 1980s and even before that, going all the way back to Mass Bob and so on, we began to talk about regional integration, right? And the Caribbean moving forward as one. We made attempts and so on, you know, they fell apart in certain areas, but then we picked up, we, we did the OECS, which 
worked very well and continues to work very well. CARICOM is now beginning to resuscitate itself and really try to pull things together, both economically and socially. And somehow, somewhere in the early part of this, our volcanic experience, we um, seem to have given over to some urging from somewhere to abandon or to, to ask permission, really, at, at, at one point, to ask permission as to whether we could participate in regional goings on. Um, I don't know when, where, or how it happened, but it did. So I want us to also consider whatever it is that we, are, we want to see with regard to Mantra and its constitution. And the constitution is the premise on which we stand. It, 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 it supports everything else. I, I would like us to look at it within that context as well. And also, a big point with me is to look at our own internal dynamics. It distresses me um, greatly. And it's not peculiar to Montserrat. I hear it because I listen to um, the, conver the political conversations and political, economic, social conversations up and down the region. Right? And um, it distresses me greatly when I listen to parliamentary debates. And as I said, it's not limited to Montreal, it happens everywhere. That those who are not in the seat of government find it useful, for want of a better word, to belittle each other, to say who does to say who senile, you know, to talk about, all of us went to the same schools, all of us have had some kind of education, none of us are dumb people, I never meant a dumb menstruation, have you? And it, it, it distresses me greatly when we sidestep the opportunity to have constructive debate for us to snipe at each other and to talk about this, that, or the other, and who, I don't even know what to say. Um, because we miss opportunities. All we, all we end up doing, do you listen to the United States politics? Do you? I guess all of us do. We don't have a choice. It's just there. Um, and they're practicing a type of politics that is, that is intentionally it intends to separate people, to separate black people from white people, to separate um, women from men, and I can go on and on. We are a tiny, tiny country at this stage in our development. We are what? They want to say we are 4,000 people. I believe we are more than that, but okay. We are 4,000 people. Where are we going sniping at one another? What, what are we achieving? Um, we have had no stability in terms of our governance for the past 25 or more years. We need to pay attention to these things. And um, with that, I think I'll stop here uh, because this conversation is about you, it's not about me. And we're here merely to facilitate. Just giving some thoughts, thank you. Okay, I will just say welcome to some members of parliament that have seen enter the building um, since we started, members of the opposition, members of the government, welcome. The floor is now open. We are only here to facilitate the conversation, and so it's open. Please make use of the mic to share any of your thoughts. Um, if you prefer for me to um, give you a starting point, I can. Um, oh. Good afternoon. I know it always works better when somebody starts and then others will.
reinforce that point. I just wanted to reinforce that point that yes, I, okay, let me start over. I was saying I wanted to pick up on a point that was made by Honorable Budkin about not knowing or for want of a better statement. At some point in time, we seen that we had to start asking for permission to participate in our regional bodies. Uh, from my recollection, from the passing of the Constitution, the Munsford Constitution 2010, we actually found that based on the content of the Constitution, we had to then seek entrustments to participate in CARICOM, etc. So I just want to agree with you and reinforce the point that the root problem where that is concerned starts with our Constitution and obviously we need to address the Constitution. So that, that's my point. I just wanted to start the ball rolling and I know others will follow. Good evening. I, I wonder why the leader of the opposition didn't start by saying what was on his mind. He piggybacked on what was on Mr. Bodkin's mind. I would like to say what is on my mind. And I want to start off, one of my friends just whispered behind me to be careful. But I don't think I'm, I've ever been afraid of putting my head above the parapet. Ever since we've been discussing the Constitution, Montserrat Constitution order, way back in 20, 2008, I was a part of that committee. Uh, Dr. Lewis had invited me, along with a lot of other much more esteemed persons to review certain things. And I wrote on the Constitution, the draft Constitution, before it was passed in our parliament. And I warned, I sought to warn our elected officials and parliamentarians that it was a mistake and it was wrong. And indeed, it was a silly thing to do to pass the Constitution in our Parliament because it could now be said that this is what Monsat agreed to. How could you agree to something that you had no ability to change certain aspects of? I know because I went the length and breadth of the country with the, the committees that were, were doing the, the, the town hall meetings and there were certain things that were just off limits. You couldn't suggest taking them out of the Constitution. So it was never a Montserrat Constitution. It was, as, it's, as, it, as it reads now, it was the Montserrat Constitution order which was delivered to us by the United Kingdom government. However, the records will show that a number of our elected parliamentarians voted for it in our parliament. Having said that, the Constitution does have a clause which allows it to be amended by a resolution voted on by two-thirds majority of the Parliament. We should be able to open the Constitution for, well, request, request of the British government that we have the discussion. That is what is suggested in the Constitution. I suggest that having regard to all what was said by the UK parliamentarians in their deliberations the other day, that they dare not refuse if we pass such a resolution in our parliament, they must, because that is what they said. It is what we want. And they said the word family, I went and checked back through Hansard, and I counted 48 times they mentioned that we're family. I don't know what family treats family the way that we've been treated. Having said all of that again, I want to posit that the first thing we should do with regard to the Constitution and our relationship with the United Kingdom is to seriously decolonize the relationship. It is still a colonial relationship. A governor is sent to Montserrat. This is the 21st century. 
and we elect a government to govern us, but then somebody sends a governor who has more power, I am told, in many instances, than the elected parliamentarians. Mr. Farrell went the length and breadth of Montserrat and told us that he knows how to take Montserrat forward and he would be a better leader than Donaldson Romeo and Paul Lewis. And the majority of Montserratians agreed and we gave him the leadership of the country. But then somebody is sent from someplace else to supposedly have more power than him. That it, 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 it boggles the mind that that would be allowed to happen in the 21st century. Antigua, our neighbor, gained their independence November 1981. I was a little boy watching the grainy TV, ABS, when Papa Bird declared independence. A few years later, St. Kitts, September 1983, independent. Montserrat. Do the maths, by the way. Antigua, independent, 42 years ago. St. Kitts, this year will be 40 years independent. And Montserrat is still languishing as a colony. It is a travesty. It is indeed an abomination. And we need to fix that as a people. And history must record that we at least made attempts to do such. So I am imploring my fellow citizens to take the opportunity to write to the committee that is looking at it now. Shirley is correct. Mrs. Ms. Osborne is correct. We should not be waiting for them to ask us and invite us to make comments. We should be putting something together and putting it forward proactively. Are we satisfied? Are we comfortable with the situation as it is? And let me just say, by the way, that anybody listening to me and thinking I'm speaking about them, I am not speaking about anybody in particular. Denzel West has been speaking about the undue powers of persons imposed on us for years and written about it in the newspaper when we actually exercised freedom of the press in 2010. I wrote about it. In 2018, when the last, um, whatever you want to call this, was done by the United Kingdom government and, and, and a committee of the parliament, I wrote, and I want to remind us that other people wrote, other people who live among us and call themselves now citizens of Montserrat, wrote and wrote very negatively about us and suggested that we should go back under direct rule Go back and read the record. So if we don't put what we are saying on the record, it is what other people say that will carry this way. We need to make our voices heard, and we need not everybody in this room, online, wherever, and when you get a chance, speak about what you consider to be. I think most people will agree with me an anachronism in the 21st century. Brunei, I think, was the last country that gained independence from the United Kingdom in 1984. So 39 years ago. And 39 years on, 42 years on from Antigua, 40 years on from St. Kitts, and we're still a colony being dictated to by others. I should have made notes so that I could flow more fluently, but I hope I've gotten my point across, and others will come behind me and say their piece, and mayhap I might come back to the mic and say something else later. Thank you. While we're waiting for others, oh, come on. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, given that this is a topic of overseas territories, 
the UK has a lot of them, and with that, not all relationships are, can be homogenous. You know, that will be resource intensive. So do we know where Montserrat falls in the priority compared to other overseas territories? And if so, why is Montserrat there? And if not, are you able to find out? I said, given the topic of overseas territories, given the topic of overseas territories, you know, the UK has a lot of them. And with that, they have to maintain a lot of relationships. And not all relationships can be the same. So with that, do we know where Montserrat falls in the priority order of that re of other, compared to other overseas territories? We don't have the answer to that question. Um, what we do know is that in the groups of overseas territories, you've got the inhabited um, islands, the uninhabited islands, and you've got those who have devolved the government. Montserrat and St. Helena, out of the 14 territories, are the only two that remain in granting aid. The others are in a different category to Montserrat and St. Helena. And we are all kind of in one part. I think the um, leader of the opposition can correct me or the um, past premier. Um, and we are dealt with on a one-to-one. -one. I'm not sure that there's a separate pot with Montserrat's name on it or a separate um, way Sorry, that Montserrat is dealt with. Like I didn't mean like financial, but I just mean like overall relationship overall. with the UK. Because, yeah. for example, I imagine Montserrat's relationship with the UK will be different compared to the Cayman Islands to the UK or Gibraltar to the UK. Um, I think we, we have no way of knowing really um, where, where we stand specifically, because the British don't say these things. But I think we are smart enough to figure that out. And one of the things that we ought to cons among the things that we ought to consider are um, what um, Denzel mm -hmm. spoke about earlier and Ms. Bodkin spoke about our regional relationships. I think one of the things that we forget when we talk about how powerful Montserrat used to be, Montserrat is a full and founding member of CARICOM. Montserrat is a full and founding member of the East Caribbean Central Bank. Uh, and OECS and therefore the East Caribbean Central Bank. Those are important institutions. Now when Britain left the Caribbean, left us with nothing, nothing to get started with, which is one of the reasons why we're still having so much trouble and the, the conversations about reparations continue. Britain is coming back and reasserting, trying to reaffirm, regain a footing for very specific reasons. They have to do with geopolitics and have to do, and Montserrat is important in this because it has lost, when, when St. Kitts, Antigua, Grenada and so on became independent, Britain lost um, a lot of its leverage with them just because that's how it works. In order to regain some of that, it can't get it through the BVI or through Cayman Islands or through Bermuda. Its insertion, its reinsertion or reaffirmation of power within the Caribbean will come through Caribbean, um, the, the CARICOM, ECCB, East Caribbean Central, um, the OECS, this Caribbean Development Bank, places like that. So Montserrat, I think we get to think deeply about this and remind ourselves about this. Because Montserrat has full voting rights, in, these, in the OECS, for example, when, um, when certain decisions are made, it has to be, the, the, the voting has to be unanimous. CARICOM, I think, has some of the same things. So for example, if we go back to the, um, the, East, the EC dollar being tied to the US dollar, Montserrat was the one who stood up and said, no, we want, we, this is what we want. And so the decision had to be made in that, uh, that decision had to be made. In order for Britain to influence decisions like that, it can simply work through Montserrat. It knows that, Britain knows that. And therefore Montserrat is important. All this talk about the biodiversity and the beaches and the, the, the coral and so on is really, really very nice. The environment is really, really nice. But the British interest in Montserrat and in the OCS territory is not about the like us. It's that, and they say so, we are strategically important. In the, in the, um, the decision, the discussion in the parliament last two weeks ago, three weeks ago, they said, 
um, the OSIS territory, Brexit has not been kind to us, and so we must lock, lock the overseas territories into trade negotiations with us. The enemy is barking at the door. The enemy is China and Russia. And they, they said those. They said, um, we must begin to station, exact words, we must begin to station British civil servants in the overseas territories for longer periods. That's what happened in the colonial, colonial times. They're saying things like um, British people must be allowed to vote in Montserrat, in the overseas territories, must be allowed to run for office eventually. Those conversations are being had. Um, a year or so ago, I was talking with a colleague of mine in Bermuda about one gentleman, about three gentlemen who had begun this, another aspect of this conversation, and they um, had done an interview on the radio in Bermuda, and they had asked him, so have you spoken to the overseas? No, we don't need to speak to them. Which comes back to my point, we need to be the ones who say, no, 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 here's what we want. So the relationship, to answer your question, what I think um, we need to remind ourselves about and stand firm on is that we have values. Where they place us in their priority list is of secondary interest. Where we insist that we must be is what matters. So we need to begin to leverage those relationships. You can get into CARICOM through us. You can get into the OECS through us. You can get into the ECCB. And if you get into the ECCB, you also get, in, you get connected to the Barbados um, Central Bank, the Jamaican Central Bank, the Trinidad, Republic of Trinidad Central Bank. So Montserrat is important. Montserrat is important. Um, and and, and we, need to, we get to think about that and remind them where we ought to be standing. So what I'm hearing is that Montserrat is in a very powerful political position to influence mm -hmm. the other islands, and so therefore we use, should use it as a negotiating chip when asking what we want Montserrat to be. Thank you. Okay. If you look on the screen, we've put some information there that can trigger that can trigger conversation. And so we started with the constitutional affairs and I think Mr. West began the conversation where he spoke about the constitution and what is in the constitution. If anybody else has anything that they wanna add to that or delve more into the constitutional affairs, please do so. We've got a few trigger questions um, to consider. People, when you come to the meetings, you need to come prepared to engage. Monstrations, we need to engage. I don't want to be speaking too much, but sometimes I feel the need to fill the dead space when people come to the meetings and just be watching one another. Sorry to be blunt like that, but we need to speak. Anyway, I want to make a, 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 an addition, because you invited for the discussion on the Constitution, I recall, in all of the discussions with, about the Constitution, there was great concern about what I mentioned before, about persons being imposed on us and having more power. And one of the things that was written into the Constitution is that the powers delegated to the, the, the governor, the special responsibilities of the governor, can be delegated to any elected member of parliament. I don't know if you, you, you're aware of that. Okay? But that, that conversation has never happened. Why? Is it, is it lack of confidence in our ability to do things? Is it a lack of trust? What is it? If we're supposed to grow up and be mature and at some point take over full responsibility for our fears, why aren't we practicing? So you look, for example, at the special responsibility for international finance. Why? Why on earth does somebody have to come from England to oversee international finance in Montreal? That is not the case in a number of other territories. It is in, in a few, but in most of the other territories, that is not the case. 
it, was, it became the case in one such circumstance because of a peculiar circumstance that arose in, in um, 87, 89, when we had offshore banks flourishing. And persons decided that we should not be the ones in control. And they came with blunt instruments and shut down and decimated the whole industry to the point where we were unable to get it going again. But in the 21st century, in this 2023 year of our law, 2023, there is absolutely no reason why a minister elected by monstrations is not responsible for international finance. And um, Madam Speaker, can you list out the others? Because there's something else, I, one of the others I perhaps need to speak to. The, the special responsibilities of the governor. Oh, you want me to read it out? Just list them out, yes. So I'm just saying that going forward, we must, must create a movement and ensure that all powers are devolved to the local government to the full ex extent possible. You, you, you found the list. So the constitution under the governor's special responsibilities, number 39, it says the governor acting in his or her discretion shall be responsible for the conduct subject to this constitution of any business of the government with respect to the following matters, defense, external affairs, the regulation of internal sh international finance services, internal security, including the police service, the function conferred on the governor by this constitution or any other law in relation to the public service. Okay, I, I want you just, just for completeness, read this, the, the sentence after that. There's a sentence. And the governor that. shall keep the premier fully informed concerning the general conduct of these matters and the premier may request information in respect of any particular matter. Thank you very much. Do we need to understand anything else? Do we need to understand anything else? Or are we going to continue to allow for a situation where we don't control our own fears? And I'm saying, I'm saying to those people who would, would naturally resist I am saying that that particular one about international financial matters should immediately, immediately be devolved to a local minister. There's no, no reason for it not to be. So that's a start. Thank you. Oh, Ms. Budkin would like to add to some of that. Justin a kind of response to Mr. West's intervention. And he asked, why would it, Britain feel, feel it necessary to take over the offshore sector? And I think the answer lies in us. I said a little earlier in my introductory statement that we should be taking note of what is going on around us. And if we pay attention to what is happening in the rest of the region, the independent territories, and I would just interject here that a lot of those independent territories still carry the British monarch as head of state and seem very reluctant to let go of that. that just, that's just an aside, but with regard to the offshore sector, if one is paying attention to the conversation that is going on across the Caribbean and between the Caribbean and the rest of the world, um, their offshore sectors are not unaffected. Because what is happening, traditionally, our, we depended on the first world, so-called, for or whatever it is that we import, and for services as well. 
and in diversifying into the offshore sector, that began to change. And they began to feel it. And so they began to change the rules. Why take over our offshore sector? The simple answer is because they can. Because they are our colonial overseers. They can't do that in the independent territories and other territories across the world. So what they do is that they create an economic environment where these territories are expected to somehow conform to the ever-changing rules that um, organizations like the OECD create in terms of how we should operate. So um, jurisdictions within the region are constantly being blacklisted and having to fight their way out. And there's a cost to that. There's a cost to everything. We are now struggling, most of these countries in the region, with correspondent banking in terms of doing business with the rest of the world. And all of that is calculated to ensure, in my opinion, that we continue to be dependent on somebody else for our development. Um, I think that that is where some of the answer to that lies. It's easier for them to do it with us because we are colonies of the United Kingdom. Um, but I am happy to say that there are conversations that are beginning between the region and the rest of the world as to why this is wrong and why we need to do something about it. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the other issues, the finance, that's, the financial section is really, really critical. The other important matter that the governor and the governor has the authority to, and I say this, let me use those words, has the authority, constitutional authority to hand over, is the management of the public service, management of the people. The reality is that if you're running, a, if you're running an organization and you don't have control of your money and of your people, you're not running anything. We don't have control over our money because we are in grant in aid and as you civil servants here, you know what happens when, the, when FCDO shows up. Every year, we have to go through this process, every single year. We never get, okay, let's work for three years, five years, you can work, you know. Um, we get literally spoon-fed and, and, um, and the same thing happens with the public service. I think one of the things that is important that we think about, there is, there has been, to my mind, a systematic, systematic um, process, action on the part of the British government to undermine the relationship between the elected offic officials, the people we elect, and the, uh, the people who work for them, because ultimately, that is how it has to be. If you run a business, there's a chief executive officer, the people who work the business, the people who are employed, work for the CEO, ultimately. The CEO sets the policies, the, the guidelines, the sales goals, whatever, and the, the people work for that person, not for somebody else. What happens in Montserrat is that we are working for two separate, two separate governments, which are often at odds, and that's problematic. I was just the, about a year before I left the speaker's chair, there was a meeting, a group of people came down from England with a code of conduct for the ministers, which included all kinds of things about how, yeah, how the ministers could talk to people and how people could, yes, yes, it's Mrs. Baker and I went to the meeting. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, ultimately, we left the meeting and said, you guys can't be serious. Um, because what was happening was that they were, on one hand, literally reducing the status of the elected officials. And, and things that might seem simple to you, but for example, there was one which, when pe their people are traveling, for example, they were in the, part of the document was that when government officials travel, you travel court with everybody else. It might not seem like a big thing, but it matters. It matters how you show up in places. When I was speaker, I went to Malaysia. Mrs. Baker, remember, went to Malaysia um, for the CPA, and they put me up in this lovely hotel suite with upstairs, upstairs bedroom and all that stuff. And then they came to get me for, um, for a meeting. They knock on the door. I go to the door, 
And they tell me, um, I'm here for Madam Speaker. I said, that's me. No, 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 I'm here for Madam Speaker. I said, no, that's me. And she looked at me. You came alone? There's nobody? There's nobody with me. One, we can't afford it. And two, um, and then when, when I got picked up at the airport, the same thing happened. Where's your staff? Where are your people? Yeah? Those things matter. How you show up, how you show up matters. So something, if you're traveling with your staff, if you're traveling somewhere and you're traveling coach, you're not anybody. That's basically what they were saying. Um, and the, the issue about the conversations, what, how you approach them and how they could talk to you and the things you could say and what you could not say, those are intended to manage the relationship. And so if you have a relationship with a minister, you think you and the minister the same, could tell you what you like, when you like, how you like, then... And that's what that was to do. That was not by accident. And so among these things, one of the things that Monsat has to look at is how to redress that relationship. Of course, I know. My father's a politician. I know all the things that politicians do that they're not supposed to do. I know how they behave when, you're, you know, when, when, you, when you get into office. I've seen it. But the reality is that we elect those people, and when you elect people, you put them somewhere. You put them somewhere to do a job, and you have to allow them that status and honor it. So the Madam Speaker spoke earlier about, for example, you know, break, breaking down people and who's stupid and who's simple and who... We, no, we don't do that. You do that in private, because we are human beings, but we don't do that in public, right? And so we have to look at, when we're looking at the constitutional um, adjustments, we have to look at how we're going to operate with our leaders. They are, whether you vote for them or not, that's irrelevant. They are our leaders, and therefore we, will allow, we, we must be allowed to allow them that respect. And so the, it is possible, it is allowable in the Constitution that the government say, here's what we want. We want to be able to manage our people. And Madam, Mr. Governor, here's what we're going to have it happen. And let me just say, there have been governors here who have thought, said to me, at, at least two, why are we doing this? We, are, we come here for three years. We don't know the people, don't know the culture. Why are we the ones running the, the, the service? That needs to be addressed. That has to do with autonomy and internal self-governance. And let me just quickly say, um, Britain, in, in some of the documents, they declare that we are self-governing. You're not self-governing if you tell me how I can talk to my people, and you can tell me where I can or what I cannot do. So, these are things that we get to talk about and we get to, like I said, not just wait for them to ask us what you think, but we need to begin after this, this thing. We need to be able to, every three months, every two, whenever it pops up, send them a document, send them a letter. Here's the thing that we want to be working on now. Send it through this. Another one comes up next week, send it next week. Another one comes up a month from now, send it a month from now. Because we get to determine how we want to be, how we want to operate, what kind of country we want. And we are smart and capable and competent. We did it before. We can do it again. Um, Honorable Lewis, please identify yourself, especially for those who may not know you, who are paying attention online. So if you come to the mic, please try to identify yourself. Paul Lewis, your humble servant. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to um, just raise a concern uh, that um, I think I'm tempted to say honorable, but Mr. West, Mr. West raised a concern, and it's good to have him here for continuity because he was part of the committee. And the concern I have in terms of the powers of the governor, listed in section one as read by honorable speaker, defense, external affairs, etc., etc. But I want to go to subsection eight. We despite the areas that were listed as the, the powers of the governor, section eight went on to say, the question of whether a matter falls within the scope of section one shall be determined by the, shall be determined by the governor acting in his or her discretion. And this subsection basically if the governor in question of the day decides to exercise poor discretion, it could really cause a lot of problems for the sitting government of the day. And I just wanted to raise that concern. And on that point, I want to uh, actually beg the, 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 the 
which is will really happen here. I have a clash in meetings. I have a family meeting, and I have to leave. So I want to just ask you for your understanding. Well, I'm sure that they look forward to the debate in the house where you will share everything else that you haven't shared tonight. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Isaiah Allen, the original picture. The conversation up and down. Me had left And as one can say, um, 4,000 people. Even what you're gathering. What you're gathering, that means no interest. Right? Um, when we get Mr. West say come prepare we don't see how are we going to come this prepare when I we um, I ever got one um, okay me, me come back here 2010 November and since me come back here, me never hear about one town hall meeting of teaching the citizens the constitution. Is that the citizens and them out, they just live them life, they just go day by day. And the truth about it, and the radio asks for, we come here to give like what the relationship between Monshot and the British. Since me come back here, me meet defeat. He gone to FCD you now. I have a pull on town hall meeting with them for even question them for even know how they think about us. That, that they never happened. So the truth about it, are we, are we in a bed with some, and are we don't even know how they think? Are we just a suggest and believe? Then, who fortunate for going to these meetings with these people? They keep them to themselves. They they not share, they they not share whatsoever. Then get from these people with the citizens. So the whole point about it, um, you know, I want to use the word, the citizens still, Miss Bunkin said that, um, like, before the volcano, how we mean, like, and the way, use the word envy, maybe because the word envy, because envy, envy no good word, eh? you don't know, want to envy nobody for nothing, and you, you know what nobody envy for. That's all bad language. Envy. God, no, God, God don't even love the word envy. You get that? But the whole, the whole truth about it. Then Miss Bunkin say that, okay, like, we be little, little one another, and even say like in a parliament, when one say this, the other one, and it have to be done that way. Why? Can you fight for power? You can change speech to see how much people you can get by your side for the next election. The British know that. The British sometimes lay back and watch how we hang ourselves. Because how we are we worse anyway. Mm -hmm. All right? Mr. Romeo, this bunkin may have to go down this road here. Mr. Romeo, he come no power using the um what the British the love paper um, Mr. Wilson just call them like the, 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 the love paper. Um the I know I may not to use the word white paper. You may not to use the word white paper. It come um First call, first call, first call. 
the first call, the first call again. Okay? And Premier Romeo come, he rise to power with the first call. But then, when he reached it, you know, it seems like this first call, me actually, I manifest itself. All right? Okay. May I get political now, yeah? Dr. Sami, who come to rise to power, may I call him, he say, we are looking, we are looking at the wrong area. And we are looking for people who we think are going to help us. But they are not going to help us. Make sure all of you hear that. Everybody hear that. May not tell my life. Okay? All right. So we give Dr. Sammy one chance. But Dr. Sammy now and the administration, they may look to the same people who are not going to help us. We don't say they may look nowhere else. You get that? And just lately, you hear Premier, Premier Farrell say that when he got there, go see the King Crown. He asked them to even send some British citizens here. To even start, start to build houses and so forth to see if they can boost our economy. That they're not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So hmm? you can see the answer. Have we not got the answer? Mr. West want local to take over the, the, um, the financial. Mr. West, you can come back to the mic. If one shot Barry on loan, if one shot Barry on loan, and I will drop you, who I go back the loan? Who I go back the loan? One shot can back, one shot can back your own loan. One shot can do that. So you need you need one backer. You need one backer. You, you go to the bank for Barry and money. You need this stuff, but you work with. Somebody that you know that can back you. One shot can, one shot, no, 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 I'm footing right now for Mr. West also. All right? Truth about it, I will not grant in aid. Even some things that I will say, I was supposed to even recognize that the position that I will be in. Okay. There are things that I will, would even love to say, but sometimes you have to bite your tongue. And plenty, plenty times when you come from the year and you, ch you, you talk out all, you, you um, like, when you get done, you, 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 you try to get out. You try to get out. You. No, no, no. Your plan, your plan, with the enemy here. Mr. Okay, okay. All what the enemy need to do is just take all your planning, go and study them, counter rack them, and then go out and keep it down. Here we come. Thank you. Um, Honorable Romeo. Just to be clear, um, just to be clear, first of all, this is not the only town hall meeting that we will have. That, that has correct? not been determined as yet. It's not been determined yet? No. All right. Um, and we will have an opportunity as parliamentary. I'll this only touch on a few things. First of all, I want to make a, a very bold declaration. And that is that the right to self-determination is God-given not given to those who are rich, not given to those nations who can borrow and create a vibrant economy on their own, is given to every people who wish to assume it. Which means we do have the right to self-determination. How we achieve it requires us having the confidence that we have it and understanding in our circumstance now the legal basis on which that self-determination is hinged. I think that one of the things that needs to be done is to help the people of Monsai to understand the legal basis on which our right to self-determination is hinged. The gentleman asked a question earlier about our relationship with the UK. I think he, he asked whether we have a separate relationship to the others. According to the law on which our right to self-determination is hinged, 
the British government has an obligation for our well-being and to achieve our well-being, I'm not going to much detail, they must ensure with respect of the culture of the peoples concerned, their political, economic, social, and educational advancement. I repeat, to ensure they have that response, to achieve that well-being, they are a to ensure with respect to the culture of the peoples concerned, their political, educational, and other advancement. Keywords with due respect of the culture of the peoples. Then it states, I'm not reading the entire law. We will do that in Parliament. To develop self-government. So the British government has a responsibility to help us to develop self-government. And it says, to take due account of the political aspirations of the peoples. So they must take account of our political aspirations. And another section of the UN I think that there's a resolution that refers to the fact that we have a right to develop our own constitution. Why? Because we are geographically separate, because we are culturally different, and I keep forgetting what the third uh, point is, that we are separate to the United Kingdom. These laws are based on the very things that we need tonight to simply be able to decide on what our constitution should be and insist on it. We have that right. It's not given by the British government to us. And um, I would like to expound on that, but I won't do it now. I'll have to do that when I have a real opportunity. I wish we had more meetings. But we need to go home and read the legal basis, the law on which all that we're discussing tonight is hinged, and even parliamentarians do not know this law and understand it. I'm sorry. So the gentleman before is absolutely correct. If parliamentarians don't understand it, and the majority of us don't understand it, then this meeting will be fruitless. I'm telling you that. You, we need to understand that a law was put in place to help us to stand as equals when we speak to the British government, when we negotiate with them. A law is in place to ensure that we can stand, whether our economy is one where we are in granting aid or not. There's a law in place for us to stand as equals as parliamentarians in negotiating, in seeking to achieve self-governance, seeking to achieve self-sufficiency, all the things we need to have self-determination. There's a law in place for us to stand on as equals with the British government. To then do what I heard the speaker saying at the beginning, not have to wait on them to come to us, but take it to them. So they've, made, they've taken the initiative to come to us, but we must go to them with the understanding that we are not children. Whatever happened in the past does not mean that we cannot influence a different relationship and the one that we want. The other thing I want to say is somebody said earlier that, that um, we can be our own worst enemy. And the reason why I took my time before coming up to speak, I hope this thing I'm going to say is going to be taken well. The very constitution we have was never shown to the people of Montserrat before it was debated on and voted on in our parliament. The records will show that in 2010, when we first negotiated the Constitution, we met with, I remember the names, I think it's Doldridge, no, no, some legal representative from the UK and their team with members of parliament, opposition, and government to negotiate the Constitution. And the government was about to pass it before actually going to the public properly. And thanks to the Honorable Speaker, who is sitting there, and to the um, chief minister then, uh, R.T. Mead, after the debate, he agreed to go to the public for consultation. And he did the right thing. So Howard went to the public with, for discussion over the constitution. And after his consultation, he had 58 amendments from the people. 
the most popular of all of those amendments was that the Attorney General and the Financial Secretary should not vote. That was the most popular of all the suggestions coming from the people. Yet, not even that one was um, agreed to. Rightly or not, it was not, just to show you. But what was worse is that the amendments that were chosen were never shown to the public. And I want to tell you, the records will show that even the negotiators and the UK still have policy that shows that when you discuss a constitution, you go to the public, you develop the comments, you get comments into amendments, and the, parl the members of parliament, whether government and opposition together, come to a conclusion on what it should be. They have a responsibility to take the draft back to the public for their comment. That never happened. And that is one of the reasons why I did not vote for the constitution that we have. So, I know it's going to be a challenge. I know it's going to hurt some people for me to say this. But the truth is, this constitution reached the UK government for approval before what was agreed to in parliament was shown to the general public. So we can be our worst enemy. So while we're talking about being forced, having a constitution forced down our own throat, it was forced by our own government. And I must say this for the record, I must tell the truth so that it's not repeated again. Thank you. Okay, I wanna thank you um, for that historical um, perspective. So I wanna throw out, because we've been here for about an hour and a half already, <laughs> the time moves really quickly. So I've heard um, the need for some constitutional reforms and some things have been identified, a few things. Some of the things that may prick your minds would be our financial arrangements with this, the, the UK, the current arrangements that we have with the UK. Do we think that that is acceptable? Would we like to see it change? Our defense, our borders, um, Somebody already said that we need to look at Constitution number 98, the powers of the government, governor and the ability to borrow and to lend. Should we be able to borrow and lend? How do the UK support us in getting out of granting aid? Some other questions we have here. Our borders sufficiently protected? Should our police service be vested under the governor or should they be a minister of defense? Um, is there a need to modify, amend, change the powers granted to the governor? And which ones, if not all? Those are some questions that you can ponder on if you haven't thought about anything that you want to say as yet while um, we get some comments from Honorable Osborne. Okay, yeah, no, let the gentleman go first. Good evening, panel. Good evening, everyone that's here this evening. We are definitely joining you this evening to discuss these matters before us. And um, as part of the Rotary Club and Rotary International, we make our decision based on four principles. Is it the truth? Is it fear to our concern? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? And will it be beneficial to our concern? So as I look at the first question, um, Monsha still needs to be imported governor. I ask myself, what have we done here in the event that the governor has not been present? We have been able to function and have some um, normalcy. Have have all meetings, have cabinet conduct meetings, um, and all the other activities related to the governor has been carried out. Um, so with that being said, I think that Monster is in, in a position that we can have a local governor or somebody who would have um, a bloodline from Monstrat, even one parent, um, be in the role of governor. So they have that attachment to the country and then they can see where the nation is thinking of going. Um, I also think about the fact that we send out so many professional opportunities for persons to become scholars every year. And we have persons who study the different professions, the accounting, finance, economics, whatever it is. We can also look to groom a scholarship that will prepare somebody for that role of governor. As you see the DG filling in, um, and not the current DG, but DGs in the past, being able to fulfill the role of governor. So we do need to consider um, making the post something that a Monstration can qualify for, and I'm here to support the idea of the governor coming from, from Monstrat, right? So that's my part. Yeah. 
Yeah, just, just to um, add, add, um, add to Madam Speaker's request to, to please engage the conversation, I think um, the basic question we're here to discuss, to ask ourselves, to answer for ourselves is who do we want to be? According to the decolonization committee and that Britain has to all intents and purposes signed up, agreed with, we can continue as we are, therefore continue as a colony. We can enter into full as assimilation into Great Britain and be something like a department of like Guadeloupe and so on, are we become French territories, uh, sorry. Guadeloupe or could become just Montserrat, I mean British, part of England, no separate British um, designation. We could become independent. Uh, we could um, leave the British family and enter an association with somebody else, Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, China, you know. <laughs> um, and, and, and then what, what, what would you require? So I think the first question we need to ask is, because Denzel, Mr. West talked about it earlier. We have been on this road for a long time. We have worked. We, see, we know our capabilities. We know what it takes. I remember hearing talk when Antigua and St. Kitts and so on became, became independent. Oh, how do they go pay the bills? And now they're going to have to earn. And I, and I, I remember my father saying, well, it's a question of just like you do with your family. You figure out how to earn the money because you know what you have to pay for. And you go work for it. When you have a big, big, big family, you have to work for a lot more money. When you have a smaller family, you, you don't need as much money, but the, the, thing is, the, the principle is the same. You go earn the money. And I think that's one of the things, it's clear to me actually, that's one of the things that has stymied Montserrat's development and our ability to even consider a different relationship with Great Britain is this and we don't have any money. I hear people over and over and over when we talk about things like these, where we get the money from, I've not got the money, I've not got the money. We don't have money, we earn money. There are ways to earn money. Montserrat has all kinds of opportunities to earn money, just like everybody else. It's a question of sitting down like you would in your family. You sit down and you work out what you need to pay for, how much it's gonna cost, how you can earn the money, where you need to go, which one needs to go do what. Who needs to make the sugar cake? Who needs to go to college and do the accounting? Who needs to um, stay home and do the washing? You make those determinations. Who is going to babysit tonight while who goes out to, 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 to school or to, or to a job? We make those determinations. Because it's, it's kind of difficult to decide on any one of these, really, until we decide how we're going to earn our money. Right now, we are living, we are in granting aid, and we get this money every year that just I find it demoralizing and, and just so undignified. But the conversation that we are not hearing is how to do the work. We know how to work. We have worked before. We could go do the work to pay our own bills. We can have these conversations with the administering power and whoever else about how we are going to earn this money and what happens when we earn this money. So the clarity, for me, these conversations are more about us than about Great Britain, about uh, um, achieving uh, a state of clarity about how we move forward, because ultimately that's what it is. How do we move forward? We move forward because we have enough resources, <laughs> sorry, financial resources, human resources, natural resources, and how these things work together, how we decide these things work together to go in the direction that we want. Anyone, I remember here, um, I, and you can correct me, Denzel, you might know this, um, or Mr. Romeo also, there is, um, for example, if Montserrat decided it wanted to be independent, I think the, the way it stands right now is, well, Britain says that we will allow you, of course, if you want to be independent, we will help you, they say that, but there's a, there's a, there was, I don't know if you see, like, there's a clause in which from the moment you declare you want to be independent, you have like 18 months, which doesn't allow you. So if Montserrat for right now would say, we want to be independent, and we look at how much money we can earn from sand mining, from tourism, from um, creative arts, from whatever, um, tech, um, and we, okay, so in eight years, we'll be earning, so in, in two years, we'll be earning 100 million. In, 
three years, we were earning 110. In five years, we could bump that up. We could be at 160 million. So yeah, so in eight years, we could be earning 200 million, 300 million, so we can pay our bills, we'd be fine. But in order to, when, once you declare that, you're declaring you want to be independent. You don't have the eight years to work it up. Britain gives you 18 months. Am I, is, has that changed, Mr. West, do you know? Okay. So that's one of the things that holds us back, which gets back to our having these proactive relationships with these people. Don't tell me this. If you say you're going to help me, if you say you, you, you're interested in my self-determination and the possibility that I could be independent, if you no longer want to be a colonizer and you want to free the people, allow me to be independent, allow me the space to be independent. Don't put this restriction on me because what you're saying out to me is that I say something, but I don't really mean it. I'm not going to help you do it. So um, I have a, one, one last thing. We, I, had, I have this conversation, ongoing conversation with a friend of mine who insists that because we have a British passport, we are British. And everything else that is British must apply to us and must accrue to us. They don't accrue to us, and they clearly don't apply to us. The question is, do we want them to? When I arrived in England with my British passport that I got in the US, I slide it, and I slide it again, and then somebody says, come over here, because the electronic thing does not work. But it's a British passport with, 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 these, with the coding on it that says it should, because it's not really a British passport. But ultimately, a passport is, it allows you to travel. Does having ease, eased travel mean that you are one of us, you want the family? And should it? And what do we do with that? So these are questions we get to ask ourselves. Tonight, it's about asking ourselves questions, not about answering. So we don't have the answers, but we get to ask ourselves the questions so we can come up with the ultimate answer. Who do we want to be? What do we want Montserrat to be? And then have the conversations with this administering power and the funding agencies and whoever else about how we get to there. Ms. Ms. Osborne touched on the issue of money just now. And one of my colleagues here in the audience kept asking everybody, where you get the money from? And he challenged me also to say, what if something falls through? Who, who is your backup? Now, I want to say this. Whatever money the United Kingdom has, it got it from us. Through the sweat, blood, and tears of our forefathers. We need to recognize that first. They are not where they are by their own labor. It is forced labor that created wealth for the United Kingdom. That is fact. Could be debated, but there's only one fact. Now, I want to say to us that we must never be ashamed to ask somebody to look after what they claim to be theirs. Why on earth are we here worrying about building a port for Montserrat off of the blood and sweat of 4,000 people? It cannot happen. It is mathematically impossible. Former speaker, statistician, it is mathematically impossible for 4,000 people to have enough money to build a hospital, build a port, build schools, and you name it. It cannot happen. But I go further. It is not a Monstrat problem. There is no 4,000 people anywhere that pays for the infrastructure that surrounds them. Eh? When you live in um, Borough X in, in London and you go to the train station, is it 4,000 people around there that paid to build that train station? Can't happen. It has never happened. So why do we feel this need and feel embarrassed because we're asking for money from somebody who claims ownership of the place. When they stop claiming ownership, then we can't ask them for anything. The United Nations Decolonization Committee and the first meeting, I'm forgetting the date of the first meeting, Romeo, you might be able to tell me. When they set up the whole decolonization movement, the onus was placed on the administering power. 
to make, to get everybody to the level where they could become independent. It cannot be for the people who are oppressed and downtrodden and enslaved for the years to be the ones to pay all the money to get to where you're supposed to get to. My friend, the original patriot, said earlier that it is unfair for people to come here to be discussing and debating the, the Constitution when there's no education about it. The decolonization committee specifically says in one of the clauses, Romeo, correct me if I'm wrong, it specifically says that you're responsible for educating the people to the point where they know what is, is, is um, self-determination. They are supposed to put you on a footing and pay for it too. And I want to draw our minds when listening, for example, to um, the Caribbean Premier, Prime Minister of the Caribbean, Mia Motley. She has said on more than one occasion, I've heard her say, that one of the mistakes they made when they went independent is that they left with nothing. She has said that repeatedly. Are we going to make the same mistake? We have to. We have to. So we have to make sure that the United Kingdom, the administering power, does what the law, the international law, says they are supposed to do. Put us on a footing and educate the people as to what self-determination means. And then and only then, we can actually exercise that right. Because you're right. If, if, if you don't have the wherewithal, then why are you going to leave home? Children don't leave home and just run off into the wilderness. Their parents set them up as best they could before they leave the nest. All right? Nobody is saying that we should not work and earn for ourselves. We are not mendicants. We are not lazy. We will work. And this, the, 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 the phrase that keeps being used, the foreign direct investment and what have you, we know about that and we aspire to that. But let me just segue and ask the question. If the United Kingdom has a corporation tax of 19% and Montserrat has a corporation tax of 30%, what business from the United Kingdom is going to relocate to Montserrat? So the first thing somebody's going to say, well, you can't drop your, your corporation tax rate because you lose revenue. Well, hang on a second. The whole premise is that you're supposed to fill the shortfall in our revenue. So to the extent that if we take corporation tax from 30% to the 19% that you have, oh, we're not going to undercut you, so you call us tax haven. We're going to match you at 19%. So 19% with sun, sea, and sand, and Caribbean, we should be able to attract one or two CEOs from the UK, right? That's the thinking. And one last thing. This is something that has only recently been coming to my mind. And that is that we've been practicing democracy on the cheap. Practicing democracy on the cheap. In the United Kingdom, and, and you ask why I keep going back to the United Kingdom, that's the administering power. That's where we look to. They have 600 and something parliamentarians. How many are they, Madam Speaker? Here. MPs. 600 Here. in the UK. And each one of them, each one of them get an allowance of up to Let's, let me just call a number, it can be corrected later. But it's in the region of £300,000 in addition to their $85,000 salary. And I'm going somewhere with this, bear with me. A parliamentarian in Montserrat, a backbench parliamentarian, not in government, probably takes home $7,000. And he is expected to come to the parliament and speak on a myriad of issues and be super knowledgeable and eloquent about all manner of different things. In one sitting, he might be asked to speak on gender equality, child safeguarding, cyber security, financial crimes. And that one person with a $7,000 salary is expected to be able to do that. Practicing democracy on the cheap. A 
few years ago, Honorable Romeo made a submission through the FID and got them to fund an opposition office. But that is all it is, an office with a clerical staff. So you have a building where some people could go and sit and use a computer and one clerical staff. Okay? A UK parliamentarian can spend £230,000 hiring staff to do research for them. We're practicing democracy on the cheap. We don't have to have that amount of money. But certainly, certainly, the members of parliament, both in government and in the opposition, ought to have some measure of funding so that they have people who could work for them to research issues, write speeches for them, and bring the issues to the people, and free them up to, to, to engage with the people, rather than all the time thinking about what am I going to say about this bill next week, a bill that is in an area that they know nothing of. So I want our parliamentarians to put this front and center on the table, and Madam Speaker, when you're finished with the legislate the, 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 the assembly house, put it on your agenda as well, that you need money to carry out democracy and educating you. <laughs> Thank you. I couldn't help but follow him to make three quick statements. Number one, I did put such a proposal for additional funds for the opposition members. I haven't had a proper response yet. Secondly, he said that um, 4,000 people cannot build a hospital and a port and all of that. At present, we may not be able to do it. But the day will come when those things are provided, and not just a port, but a port that is adequate, not just an airport, but one that is adequate, that will enable the development, that will get us to the point where we can stand on our own two feet. When that happens, we will be, whether 4,000 or 10,000, be able to find a way to stand on our own two feet and decide on infrastructural change and development. So that is, should be our ambition. The other thing I want to say is, he said that we, our forefathers funded the development of the British government. So we shouldn't be ashamed to ask for what we need. The truth is, and I want to repeat this, the law that I refer to was put into force because governments other than the United Kingdom, the Dutch, and the French, who had colonies, were making it possible for us as colonies to be able to negotiate our way to having that right, no, to, to self-determination. No, no, no. To negotiate it in our way to being able to stand our own two feet. Hold on. But what I do disagree with my friend with is that self-determination doesn't begin when you get to that stage. Self-determination begins now. When you be, this meeting should lead to us taking positions that determine the future we want. Self-determination begins now, whether we have a port or hospital or not. It is God-given. Nobody can take it away from us. Nobody can stop us from having it. And history has proven that the right to self-determination is God-given because of the successes of Mandela, the successes of even the United States when they broke from the British government. Most nations who fight for that right do achieve it. Thank you. Okay, we're at the two-hour mark, so I'll give Isaiah um, a final three minutes before the panel wraps up. Yes, um, Shirley, may I greet you. You said that you want to help us. You're giving money, but you got red tapes, so we can't get the money spent. That none help, right? Um, Premier Rome, you say, it's not, no, 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 no. Are we late? Are we 20 something years late of fighting for what we believe in? Right? 
journey. We agree with you. By our forefathers, blood, sweat, and tears. We fight about it. Who fight for that? I mean, what's the pandemic? What's the pandemic we just gone? Look how we get shut down. Look sometime we know. Not the earth, least, then give you a little um, podium. And then to the end, when, 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 when the big cases, nothing, absolutely nothing. When you press the premier, this is what the premier said to all of us. So you can't say that me lie. Are we not beggars? Are we a proud people that work, that love for work? Oh my God. Blood, sweat, and tears, Johnny. Are we not a beg? Somebody, Mr. Buffon, you sit down, Nadipa, you, you, you sit down. Everybody quiet. Nobody push for nothing. Me pick up my placard. <laughs> and me go by the premier office. I you know that. I don't need to tell you, the premier get down, the premier, I don't tell you what he's doing, but he get down like the gutter, the premier go on like the office, I personal house. No, 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 no. I don't got nothing there, you know. Because I'm not a civil servant. I don't got one arm, I don't got one arm, one arm, one, one proper job out there. So when, when me even go out there with my placard, I'm going to shut my fight for. Who come with me? You got a couple people come and whisper to me, go ahead, please, yeah. But nobody stand up with me. So the point about it from this meeting tonight. How this proposal I go write up? How are you gonna write up this proposal? It's send. You think that are we supposed to even got one? Uh, since, since the constitution, not, not any anybody can go and pick up the constitution. I understand the constitution. And I understand the constitution. Wrong right. Exactly. So then are we supposed to even got one legal luminary? Who take clause by clause and ex exactly? You guys may say, look, um, may not think that I can write up nothing here for tonight unless I am um, mobilized. Get away, get away to one place that we understand exactly what we deal with. And here we got one say, now one vice, not, not me say something. Somebody counteract me. Because that's that a confusion. One vice. British, it's a war we want. And when we ask for something, I will not beg. Because our forefathers don't work for that. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to allow the members of the panel to just quickly wrap up um, before we close. Thank you. Um, I, I agree with you, Mr. Patriot. I agree with you that education is a big deal. Just having an educated populace, an educated electorate is important. In order to have these conversations be really incisive and, and um, effective, people need to know. What I can tell you is that the parliament has been working on it for a while, and they continue to, the parliament office, they continue to do that. I think what I would like us to leave here with tonight is a continued search for the answer to the question. Self we've been talking about self-determination. Self-determination is not, self-determination is the power to choose. It's not what we do, it's the power to choose. We have the right to self-determination, we have the right to choose. We have the power to make a decision, but do we have the power to effect that decision? So as individuals, I can say, we can say as a country, as individuals and as a country, we can say, this is what we want. We have the power to do that because our right gives us that power. But what will make that effective is resources. Resources include, just like you said, Patriot, I'm going to use the word brain power because it's the easiest thing to us. Us putting our brains together and coming up with this declaration of who we are and how we want to be and making that known to everybody and, and putting our power, 
our personal power, our financial power, our intellectual or educational power behind this. So what I want to leave us with tonight is that this is not the end of the conversation. You've, I've said before, um, and I keep saying it, what needs to happen on a continuing basis is that as matters come up, we let the administering power know how we feel about them and what we want to be done, what we think must be done, which requires a continuing conversation, I, I get you. And if we do that, it puts us in a position where they will always be listening to you. You know how it works. If you only talk to somebody once in a while when you meet them, they could dismiss what you say. But if you're always there, if you're always there, they're going to have to listen. And something will, will, will happen. We have the right to do that. We have the power to do that. We have tech people who make it easy to just and emails go off and websites pop up and information goes where it needs to go to. So we actually have the power to get that information into the places where it must go. The question is, are we going to exercise our power to make that happen? We know what our rights are. Are we going to exercise that right and then exercise the power to have the right activated? Thank you. Um, I began by suggesting that we need to look at context when we're looking to make change. And I spoke with regard to the various contexts or circumstances in which we operate. And just in preface to my closing comments, I would like to say this. I believe I see some people here who are members of the Civil Service Association. As a proud past member, I want to encourage you to begin to look at this document yourself and to begin to think about what you want. I know over the years we have been very, very reluctant to rest the control of the service or to move it away from where it is centered. I don't know how well that has worked for us because I, I, I believe I do know a number of public servants who suddenly found themselves bundled out of the service. And I'm not talking about junior clerks or I think I'm talking about people in very senior positions. And some of us, we were okay with that because it was making room for the rest of us that were coming up. But we need to think about that. Um, Shirley made the point earlier about that relationship. And this, I was quite appalled. I didn't know about that. This code of conduct that was handed down. I find that shocking, really. Um, but just to give a little history, when we began self-governance in 1950, whatever it was, as it was then. Members of the Legislative Council, which is what it was called at the time, were a lot of them not even able to read or write. They were illiterate. They weren't dumb, but they were illiterate because, well, that is how it was in those days. Many of our parents and grandparents were. Um, and I make the point that when we began to develop our homegrown civil service. You place the educated elite into the senior positions, which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. But what you gave, the, they were given the impression that they were there to control those out of control, dumb and illiterate people who the people had elected. I think we've come a long way from that. I think we elect very capable people, and we have to begin to examine that relationship and to see where we want it to go. I'm not going to make any suggestions. I've said what I've said. And it's for you to think about it and think about where you want it to go. And is it working for you now? 
um, and also to remind that this is a conversation that must be ongoing. And one of the sobering things that came to me as you we were having this discussion is that governments around the region have made attempts at constitutional change. They have not been very su successful. People are very reluctant to part with what was and still is. And so when various governments attempted even to remove themselves from the monarchy thing as head of state, there was rebellion amongst the people and they refused to go down that road. So I just want us to have that in thought and, and maybe my hope is that we will make Monstrat a beacon for the rest of the region by moving forward. We've always been progressive people and I would like to see us continue that and to see how we can shape and mold this document, this, 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 this thing to reflect who we are and where we really want to go. Bearing in mind our constitutional status, you know, um, as it stands. But always keep the context in mind when you're having these discussions. Thank you very much. So I've heard quite a bit tonight. I think what stands out is the fact that we as a people, the majority, think that the current state of affairs with our relationship with the UK is unsatisfactory and that there is room for change. We voiced some of those changes tonight. I think that there are more changes that can be voiced and that we probably haven't heard tonight that we would welcome so that we can add it to the document. Please, I know that some sentiments about persons not being aware of what is in the Constitution. We know when something feels off, even if you can't pinpoint exactly where it is in a Constitution or in a document. We live here, we work here, we know when something doesn't feel right. When something is done and you feel that little un you're, you're uneasy about it and you're thinking something just doesn't feel right about this, that thing might be something that needs to change. So don't be afraid to voice it and to send it forward and to say, you know what, this happened the other day. I didn't like it. Perhaps this is something that we need to consider changing. I also heard from Mr. West very early in the conversation that in five years ago, when we did something similar to this, we had one document which put forward what a lot of Russians wanted, but then we had other documents which went up, which went against what we wanted. And that sentiment came out several times for the evening that sometimes we are our own worst enemies in terms of we keep fighting against each other and so we don't get to progress. Um, we go move forward. And so we need to be conscious about that. If we want to change, we have to move forward with one voice. Doesn't mean that we're gonna always agree or that people are not gonna have opposite um, opinions, but as a majority, if we can agree as a majority on some things, then we have to go forward with that majority in order to progress or we will not. I think Madam Speaker Shirley, she spoke about traveling and where you, how you arrive, how it matters. And just recently at the speakers conference in Anguilla, where we had the speaker of the UK, it was quite obvious when we got there that something was very different from those of us from the overseas territories and the speaker of the UK. It was obvious. He was in a different vehicle from the rest of us and he had way more security than the rest of us. As a matter of fact, myself and two other territories, we noticed it off the bat and we asked the question as to why, well, why is there this difference? And immediately we were told, well, because the speaker is number three in the order of precedence in the UK, when he travels, they actually send security forces before him to check out everything. 
and then he has to be given that kind of protection. We then said, but we are fourth in most of the overseas territories. The speakers and the order of precedence also have that order of precedence in their countries. However, because we tend to water down things in our jurisdiction, then other people tend to treat us the same way because we see that it's not important to us, so they don't make a big deal about it either. You can ac you will accept it, so we'll just give it to you. When he travels, that is unacceptable. So we, again, have to determine how we want to be treated and what we would like so that other people can reflect that back to us. The conversation is not going to be over here. We're going to try to find some other ways to engage the public so that we can get more input. So please listen out to the radio and from my office to see what's going to be the next step so that we can progress. I want to say a big thank you here. I should have said welcome to the Rotary Club at the beginning and thank them so much for coming here tonight as their normal club activity and for supporting the public engagement. Thank you so much. Thanks to all of the others who are here who took the time to come out and to engage. Although some people just listen, I know that you have a lot to say. If you want to write down your thoughts, you can write them down and send them into my office. We want to thank ZJB, GIU, um, Mr. What's his last name? Maiga, I don't know his last name. Graham? Yes. For um, the sound. And I want to say a huge thank you to the two panelists who jumped in the very last minute to assist here and did so well. Thank you to Ms. Osborne and to Ms. Bodkin. You brought a wealth of knowledge and history um, to the conversation, and I appreciate it. To those who are listening online, we want to thank you for tuning in, and we look forward to engaging with you in another session, in another forum. Thank you so much, and have a good night.